Howdy, folks, and welcome to the show. This week on the program, we're going to be talking about a very interesting subject. There's a group of people who claim that a long time ago, there was a god, and this god was born on December 25th and was born of a virgin, and his birth was attended by a sign, a star in the east. He was adored by three kings. He taught at age 12. He started a ministry at age 30. He had 12 disciples. He traveled with the disciples performing miracles. He was known as the truth, the light, and the good shepherd. But he was betrayed, crucified, buried for three days, and then raised from the dead. And this God was not Jesus Christ. According to the people who tell this story, this god was a different deity entirely, a different deity named Horus, and they claimed that Horus came before Jesus Christ, and therefore Jesus Christ is just a ripoff of the god Horus. In this episode, we're going to take a look at these claims, and to join me, I've got my buddy John Sorensen on the line. Uh, He's done a lot of work on this issue. He has uh, published on this issue, and so I thought he'd be an ideal person to bring on the show this week. Welcome to the program, John Sorensen. Hey, Jimmy. How's it going? It's going okay. How are you doing? I am doing fantastic. Just enjoying this heat wave that we have going on here in Southern California. It, it It is... going on. Yes, indeed. I'm glad you're enjoying it. Uh, For folks who may not be aware, what can you tell us about yourself? Uh, I am the director of marketing for Catholic Answers. Uh, I uh, I am a a, uh, revert, I guess you could say, to Catholicism. I came to the church. I was confirmed in uh, 2003. And uh, I came from a position of, uh, I I was an atheist and a mythicist, uh, which is what uh, we are going to talk a little bit about today. Okay. So you you were raised Catholic, at least in your early days, but then you drifted from the church, became an atheist, and specifically adopted this position we're going to talk about called mythicism, but then came back, right? Yes. Okay. And I know you've uh, you've been doing a lot of work on this subject. In fact, you were recently on another podcast that was run by uh, some folks on the other side of the divide. Uh, can you tell us about that? Yeah, I was on the uh, Dogma Debate podcast with uh, host David Smalley, and um, he <clears throat> he is a mythicist. Okay. And so, but we only touched on uh, the subject briefly, uh, and uh, it was an interesting conversation. Um, you know, I, it's it's uh, it's always interesting to talk to these folks uh, because you you find out uh, that they really don't. I, I don't think they I don't think they research these claims. Uh, you know, they hold to them, but they don't they don't really research them. Because I think that if they did, like I did, uh, you wouldn't you wouldn't hold to this position anymore. Right now, let's let's talk about that research. Uh, in a minute, but first we probably ought to stop and define what is mythicism exactly. A lot of people won't have heard that term. Okay, so so mythicism is uh, mythicists are essentially a, a group of people who deny that a historical Jesus ever even existed. So Jesus was a myth. Yes, yes, and some of them uh, some of them do this by by claiming that Jesus, uh, that the early Christians uh, just kind of cobbled together this uh, their own religion based on these stories of other more ancient gods. And, uh, you know, some will, you know, some like uh, author D.M. Murdoch, uh, who also goes by Archaria S., uh, she claims that the that Jesus never existed in fact he was a uh, an astrological deity uh, that was concocted by the early Christians and and given this sort of uh, historical persona in, in order to make the uh, the religion more legitimate okay um, so Dia Murdoch is one mythicist and who are some others in case people might encounter their names? There, there are other, uh, there are other mythicists that are um, that are a little more sophisticated, like Robert Price, uh, Richard Carrier. Those two come to mind. Um, they tend to focus on um, uh, historical criticism of, especially of the scriptures. Uh, but they do wander into the, uh, you know, the comparisons to. Uh, uh, 
pagan deities also themselves. There's another guy that comes to mind is uh, David Fitzgerald. Do all mythicists think that Jesus is in some, one way or another based on pagan myths, or do some just say, well, he just never existed, but there's no particular pagan connection here? Yes, some of them do claim that that there's no particular pagan connection, and they rely more on uh, historical criticism of the uh, the scriptures and uh, what evidence we do have for the existence of Jesus, like the early church fathers or the existence of uh, heresies in the early church. Okay, so the term mythicist can include both those who just say Jesus is a myth, but there's no real pagan connection, but then it can also include those who say Jesus is based on pagan myths. Yes. Okay. Now, um, you mentioned that a lot of the mythicists don't really do a lot of research. And obviously, you know, they do like read mythicist websites. Uh, and you'll see claims on those websites, like the ones that I began the show with. You know, I had, had this uh, whole list of them that uh, was taken from a mythicist website comparing Jesus to Horus. So they do at least do that. So what do you mean when you say they don't do research? Because obviously they're reading their own websites. Yes, I think what when I say they don't do research, I'm 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 speaking more of the the average Joe who will look at these long lists of um, comparisons and say, oh well, and just take it for what it is. Oh, look at this list. You know, Horace was also born of a of a virgin and on December 25th. But they don't they don't dig deep. They don't dig any deeper than that. They don't say, okay, well, if Horace was really born of a virgin, what, what's the story? Where, you know, where does this, where does this belief come from? Right. There's kind of a parallel in, uh, anti-Catholic apologetics where some decades ago, uh, a Protestant gentleman named Lorraine Bettner wrote a book called Roman Catholicism, and he had this big list of supposed Catholic inventions, uh, which he assigned dates to, and and you know a lot of them were false or misleading. And his book was popular enough, though, that people just started copying that list and putting it in tracts and in other books. And so an ordinary person would, would see this list and say, oh, well, the Catholic Church can't be true. Look at this big list of inventions uh, <laughs> that came at these really late dates and so forth. And they never dug past that into the source documents that it was allegedly based on. And if they'd done that, they would have found the source documents don't actually support this material. And in the same, it's kind of the same thing here with the Jesus Horus connections. Absolutely. As a matter of fact, uh, it, it was one of your articles that I read uh, probably, I would say about nine or nine or 10 years ago. Um, I'm trying to remember the name of the article. It was, uh, is Catholicism pagan? Uh -huh. And, uh, and the articles that you made in there, uh, made me start to second guess my my uh, my belief that Jesus was just a rip off of earlier pagan myth and so that's really when I started doing uh, this research I wanted to to you know figure out you know is what I believe correct or you know is there some other explanation uh, do these stories actually predate Jesus I just I, I became really curious at that point because of that article that you wrote cool and that would have appeared originally in uh, this rock magazine now Catholic answers magazine Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, we've covered a little bit of the mythicist phenomenon today, but what we're here to do primarily is talk about the alleged Jesus Horus connection. So let's start talking about that. First of all, where was Horus worshipped? I mean, what, what pantheon did he belong to? Horus belonged to a pantheon of ancient in the ancient Egyptian religion. Okay, so uh, not Norse, not Greek, not Roman, not Indian, Egyptian. Specifically, yes. Okay. And what did uh, what did the Egyptians believe about Horus? The Egyptians believed that Horus, uh, well, first of all, they uh, his he's he's always depicted in uh, in their artwork uh, as a falcon or a man with a, a falcon head. Right. And he was generally believed to be the god of sun and the god of war. And later on, as the, uh, as the mythology developed, far the uh, pharaohs eventually were believed to have been a manifestation of Horus. Right. So the, li the living pharaoh was the living Horus in Egypt. Yes. Okay. Um, now, what's, what's the basic... Horus myth. Uh, you know, each god has a cycle of stories connected with him, you know, who, who he was born to and, and things like that. What, uh, what's Horus's basic story? 
that's a really difficult that's a really difficult uh, one to nail down because the, every every region in in Egypt had a different belief about Horus. So there was it's there's almost never a, a sort of linear story about him. Uh, it, nowhere near what you would have, say, in Christianity, like what you and I are, are used to. Um, so it's really hard to nail down any specific story. I mean, there are different birth stories. There are, are different stories about his, his life. Uh, there's, there's a story uh, about, um, uh, about his death. He's poisoned. Um, but th- there, there aren't any, um, there's not one specific uh, story that I could give. Okay. Um, now let's talk then for a minute about how, how people got the ideas that there were these parallels between Jesus and Horus. Um, that's going to take us back, not just into the 20th century, but into the 19th century. And there was a phenomenon at the time known as Egyptomania. What, what was that? Well, Egyptomania started after, uh, after Napoleon's uh, after Napoleon started a French campaign into Egypt and Syria around 1798, mm-hmm. and one of Napoleon's soldiers by the name of Pierre Francois Bruchard discovered the Rosetta Stone. Okay, so the Rosetta Stone was a big discovery uh, that helped us learn how to read Egyptian because what it was is a piece of rock and it had a decree written on it in three scripts and kind of the top portion had the Egyptian hieroglyphs that we're we're familiar with uh, and then underneath that it had another representation of the same decree in what's known as Demotic script, which is another ancient Egyptian script. It's the same language, but it's a different way of writing it. And then the real key was at the bottom in the lowest uh, part of the Rosetta Stone. The same decree was represented in a language we already could understand, which was Greek. And so by comparing the, uh, the Greek text of the decree to the Demotic Egyptian and the hieroglyphic Egyptian representations, we were able to crack the uh, the ancient Egyptian writing system, and that's uh, something that was done in particular by a guy named Francois Champollion, who uh, eventually traveled to Egypt and learned how to read lots of different stuff, and that was kind of the beginning of a lot of the enthusiasm for Egypt in the 1800s, uh, or the Egyptomania you were talking about, right, John? Mm-hmm, absolutely. So how did that manifest? Uh, you know, how did, how did Europeans manifest their interest in Egypt at this time? E- Egyptomania really manifested itself uh, after the Rosetta Stone and in, in some really amazing ways. Uh, the, the people people began to mimic the uh, architecture of uh, ancient Egypt and uh, Europeans just became uh, really fascinated with all things ancient Egypt to the point where it it got a little silly. You could actually mail order mummies uh, through catalogs. And uh, eventually what happened was certain, uh, since it was still kind of in its infancy, you had people who would start writing about uh, about about ancient Egypt, and uh, and these people were sort of self-styled Egyptologists, even though there, it, it had not become an academic discipline at that point. And so a lot of the a lot of the stuff was really based on speculation. Okay, so this is kind of the birth of Egyptology, and like all, any science that's being born or any field of study that's being born, the early stuff is inevitably gonna be of lesser quality. Um, Absolutely. So who were some of the figures that were associated with this period in the development of Egyptology? Well, the first name that comes to mind and the one that mythicists tend to quote when the most often when they're trying to draw this comparison between Jesus and Horus is a poet and amateur Egyptologist by the name of Gerald Massey, who lived from 1828 to 1907. And Gerald Massey wrote three books on Egyptology. Uh, One is called The Book of the Beginnings. Uh, The other is The Natural Genesis. And the third and the one that uh, is quoted most often is called Ancient Egypt, The Light of the World. And uh, Gerald Massey really is the first one to start making these Jesus-Horus comparisons. 
Okay, so you'll find those in, in Gerald Massey's books. Yes. Mm-hmm. Okay, and uh, who else uh, was um, associated with this period? I know there's one guy in particular. You still find his books in print, and I, I've, I actually have some on my shelves. Uh, he's, he seems to be a little more popular, I guess, than Gerald Massey um, in that you can actually walk into a bookstore and find this guy. Do you have a sense of who I'm talking about there? Yes, uh, that's uh, that's E.A. Wallace Budge, and uh, his, his, full, his, his full name is Sir Ernest Alfred Tom- Thompson Wallace Budge. It's a really long name. Prodigious. Uh, but Yes, but, but he is a, uh, he's an early 20th century Egyptologist, and he is also quoted by a lot of mythicists. His stuff is not as his stuff is not quite as speculative uh, as Gerald Massey's and his uh, his his research into Egyptology into ancient Egypt is a little more serious than Gerald Massey. Right. So he he has like books of language resources trying to translate various Egyptian concepts and things like that. Right. Right. Yeah. And although, so, but, although they still have a significant. They still reflect the kind of primitive state of Egyptological studies. I, I love there's a line in the Stargate movie where they're trying to figure out the writing on the Stargate, and Daniel Jackson notes that, oh, this is from one, one of Wallace Budge's books. I don't know, know why they even keep them in print. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's true. I mean, and that really is the attitude of, of modern Egyptologists to a lot of this early work. That stuff was really in its infancy, and, uh, you know, and, and it just has had not come along as far as, as it has now, and so they were at a little bit of a disadvantage. And you know, I think Gerald Massey is is a little kind of on the kooky side, whereas E. A. Wallace Budge was was a lot more uh, a lot more serious, a lot less speculative, but still, you know, uh, a product of of its of his time. Right. So so before we discovered that the pyramids were actually landing platforms for alien spaceships, there was this kind of <laughs> kooky period um, where you had a lot of people trying to draw parallels between Christ and between Horus and other Egyptian gods, too, for that matter. But this is the one that has kind of become the main focus of a lot of mythicism today. Um, so let's talk about the specific claims that are made by modern mythicists. Um, the first one, uh, I guess starting at the beginning, uh, we have this idea that Horus was born of a virgin on December 25th. Is there any basis to that? Yeah, no, <laughs> not at all. There's uh, Horus. Horus is in in most of the in most of the mythology. Uh, Horus is the son of the goddess Isis, mm-hmm. and his father was Osiris. And the story goes like this: Osiris his is enemies with his own brother Set. Set yeah, or Sutek. Mm-hmm. Yes, and and Set event is Set overcomes Osiris. And kills him, and in some versions of the story, he spreads the body parts around Egypt. In another version, he throws the body into the Nile. In both versions, uh, the phallus goes missing. Um, in the Nile version, it's eaten by catfish. Um, I'm not exactly; it's not clear how uh, how it how it disappears in the uh, uh, in the version of the story where it, the body parts are spread around uh, Egypt. But uh, so eventually Isis retrieves all of the body parts of her dead husband and uh, except for the phallus. She revives Osiris and fashions a new phallus and she is impregnated sexually. So there's no that's just not a virgin birth. Okay. So it's and, and the 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 new phallus is actually a prosthesis, right? Right, yeah, yeah. Okay. In the in the story where uh, uh, where she uh, cre- in the story where he's it's eaten by catfish, she fa- she uh, fashions one out of gold. Okay, so um, so this is not a virgin birth. Number one, uh, it instead it's a sexual birth with like a kind of semi reanimated zombie dad. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay, and we should point out that Osiris doesn't actually come back to life in this myth. He he stays dead, which is why I said a zombie dad. Uh, uh, and he becomes the lord of the of the kingdom of the dead. Yes, exactly. Okay, so um, so it's not a virgin birth. It's an ordinary, well, not ordinary, but it is at least a sexual birth. Um, it, did it occur on December twenty fifth? Uh, that's 
it's 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 difficult to say because uh, what they try to do is uh, is relate the birth of Horus to uh, uh, to the winter solstice. Mm-hmm. And uh, as far as I can tell, there's only one mention of a celebration uh, that has to do with Horus, and uh, this is reported in, in uh, by Plutarch. Uh, you know, writing some. He's Plutarch is a Greek historian, and he wrote about 70 years after the advent of Christianity. And Plutarch reports that there was a time. Uh, near the winter solstice, where the Egyptians would parade a uh, a cow around around these temples, and uh, and Plutarch says this comes from a book called the Birthdays of Horus. And I looked everywhere, and I can't find this book or, or anything like it. It may not uh, survive. Yeah, so it's the only mention we have of anything like this is in Plutarch, and so there isn't really any definitive uh, information in that regard. Okay, so what we have is a mention by a Greek historian claiming that some Egyptians performed a ceremony around the winter solstice, which you would expect of any religion that's tied into nature. Every religion is mm-hmm. going to have those. Um, and and this happened to be mentioned in a book called The Birthdays, plural, of Horus, uh, right. which which would suggest at most that some Egyptians did a ceremony that may have been a birthday commemoration for Horus around the time of the solstice, but only some of them because others apparently had other birthdays they were celebrating for Horus. So we we have a very tenuous connection here. And since the winter solstice, is, at least on our calendar, is not December 25th, um, it's it's very you're really going out on a limb to to make an equation and just say well Horus was born on December 25th and Jesus was supposedly born on De- December 25th which the church actually doesn't teach right and so you've got a really tenuous connection here at best yeah exactly and it's but they state it so matter of factly for instance in the film Religious with Bill Maher he just states it very matter of factly you know Horus was born on December 25th and uh, you also see that in that popular uh, internet film Zeitgeist Mm -hmm. and make the same claim there. Without any of the qualifications or noting any of the evidence we just pointed out. Right. Okay. Um, So there's kind of one event in the life of Horus, his birth, that doesn't look so parallel to Jesus after all. What about this other thing uh, that he was allegedly baptized? Tell us about that. Yeah, uh, this also comes from th- this comes from Gerald Massey <clears throat> from his book uh, Ancient Egypt: Light of the World. He he in the book he claims that uh, there's this character uh, called Anup Anup the Baptizer. Okay, and and uh, you can't there's so he kind of a John the Baptist figure only it's Anup instead of John. Yeah, exactly. I never I didn't see any I didn't see I don't recall reading any clear comparisons to to uh, John the Baptist by Gerald Massey. That seems to come a little bit later with uh, D.M. Murdoch. I could be wrong about this. Uh, but D.M. Murdoch's uh, scholarship, if you want to call it that, is is the is the basis for the Zeitgeist film, and so they have a uh, a study uh, guide that you can get for free online. And according to this study guide, uh, she claims that Anup is actually the god Anubis, and tries to draw comparisons between Anubis and John the Baptist. Hmm. Okay. Yeah. By yeah. the way, we should mention for folks who may not be aware, what is you mentioned two films. One is Religious by Bill Maher, and that's kind of a, a sort of a documentary mockumentary starring Bill Maher. And the word religious religious is supposed to be a, a combination that he made between the word religious and ridiculous, right? Yeah, exactly. And he spends the he spends the entirety of the movie sort of, you know, uh, making fun of uh, Jesus impersonators at creation museums, and that's his big refutation of Christianity in that film. Okay. Um, the other film you mentioned, Zeitgeist. What's that for people who may not be aware of it? Zeitgeist is actually a a. Uh, it appears to be. I've watched the whole thing, and my impression was that it's it's a it's a nine eleven 
truther movie where 911 was a, is a is a giant conspiracy but uh it, it somehow it connects it tries really hard to connect uh religion uh to this conspiracy and and in the beginning of the film the first third of the the, the the first third of the film concentrates on showing that Christianity was just sort of invented in order to sort of mind control people and uh, and and so they try to debunk Christianity and one of the things that they do is they begin with with Horace and uh, drawing the comparisons there and claiming that Jesus is just a uh, a, a rebranding of Horace and uh, and and the film was quite popular i mean it's got millions of views on the uh on the internet which is surprising considering the way it comes across is just random crazy strung together yeah yeah it's amazing yeah um okay so let's talk then about the alleged baptism of of horus was there an an up the baptizer and was baptism part of the horus myth there was no an up the baptizer and baptism is not even part of the uh, of the Horus myth uh, there I was I did some research on into this and I looked at the Journal of Egyptian archaeology and according to according to the journal there are some there are some depictions of a sort of uh, of a of a ritual coronation that involved water a, a coronation of the Pharaohs and uh, but generally this is this is depicted as as the the pharaohs having water poured over them by one of the gods and so and and, and the journal of egyptian archaeology indicates that it, it may have been a spiritual event that never actually happened in reality okay but regardless uh, there are no depictions of horus being ritually washed by anubis so the anup the baptizer john the baptist uh the comparison seems to fall apart at that point. Okay. Um, so what we have is a ritual where water may have been poured over a pharaoh as part of his uh, coronation. But that's a very different thing than saying the god Horus was baptized. Um, you, I suppose you could try to connect those by saying, well, at a certain stage in Egyptian history, the pharaoh became regarded as the living Horus, but, um, but, and, and he got water poured over him, so transitively you could try to say the, uh, the god Horus was baptized, but that really doesn't follow because um, it could be that it's the baptism, the coronation rite that makes the Pharaoh the living Horus. Not that Horus was baptized, but this is what introduces him into the state of being Horus. You could maybe say that, but even that presupposes that uh, that we're at a stage in Egyptian history where the Pharaoh has come to be regarded as the living Horus, and even that presupposes that these two concepts are somehow related in the Egyptian mind, which we really don't know. You just can't go from a picture of a, a Pharaoh having some ceremony performed and then jump from that to saying, therefore, this ceremony was also performed for Horus. Yeah, you know, the other thing uh, that uh, is, is uh, worth pointing out is that when a lot of, a lot of times when mythicists make these claims, they'll, they'll use Christian terminology to describe these events. So just because somebody's having water poured on them does not necessarily mean that uh, it has the same effects that, uh, of baptism that Christians believe. Indeed. And in fact, w you know, when you talk about baptism and you use that word in English, it connotes the idea of like a single event that's done one time for a person and that has certain spiritual effects and that symbolizes certain things. But uh, there are all kinds of different water rituals in different religions. I mean, water is rather important to the human condition, <laughs> and you would expect water to be taken up and used in various ways in various religions. That doesn't make them all the same. Uh, a lot of religions have uh, purification rituals that are not one-time things at all. Judaism is a case of that. Um, where there are uh, repeated ritual purifications that are done. Um, you also have ones that, that are not symbolizing what Christian baptism symbolizes, which is incorporation into the death and resurrection of Jesus. And you have uh, water rituals that don't uh, have specific spiritual effects, like giving you regeneration, uh, the new, new spiritual life. 
so even if you were to say, okay, there's some kind of water ritual going on here that maybe somehow applied to Horus, it wouldn't make it baptism. Right, right. They're just using the same language. Yeah. Um, okay, so so that covers baptism. Now, supposedly after that, Horus uh, got himself 12 disciples. What's the basis for that? Oh, boy, the 12 disciples. <clears throat> this is a fun one. Again, this comes from Ancient Egypt, Light of the World by Gerald Massey. And uh, Gerald Massey points to a mural that he calls the 12 who reap the harvest. The problem is Horus does not appear in the mural at all. So he's, he's just he's making this connection based on there, there's a mural with 12 people in it. And it's Egyptian, and so this must have something to do with Horus. But, uh, you know, there's no indication of who these 12 people are, and there's no, uh, and Horus is not in the mural. So it seems like quite a stretch to say that Horus had 12 disciples. In, in the stories of Horus, uh, there, there's one myth where uh, Horus has four sons. There's another myth where he's got six semi-gods that follow him. And then there are, in other myths, he's got various numbers of human followers, but there are never just 12. Okay, so the the idea of 12 disciples, there's just no substantial basis for that at all. Not that I have seen. Okay. Um, okay, also like Jesus, he was supposed to heal the sick and perform other miracles. What can you tell us about that? Isn't that just kind of standard fare? I mean, that's kind of what gods do, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, if a, if a god couldn't do anything miraculous, he'd be kind of a wimpy god. But uh, uh, this particular uh, parallel... Uh, it, it seems to find its uh, its origin in in a uh, an archaeological artifact known as the Metternich Stella. Okay. And and uh, just so that uh, you know the listeners have an idea of what a stella is, it's generally a large block of uh, wood or stone with inscriptions on it. And uh, this particular uh, stella is called the Metternich Stella because it was given to. It was it, it was excavated uh, actually from a Franciscan monastery, and uh, the the Egyptian uh, ruler Muhammad Ali Pasha gave the stella to Prince Metternich of Austria, and so that's where it gets its name from, the Metternich Stella. Okay. And and on this stella, there is a story where uh, the child Horus is is killed with poison. Uh, Seth uh, or Set uh, poisons Horus and he dies. And his mother Isis pleads with the god Thoth to heal the, Horus. That was the god of magic, has the He's, ibis bird head. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And and so she she pleads with Thoth to heal Horus, and and Horus is brought back to life at that point. And uh, so what what the Egyptians would do was they would pour water over this stella. And then they would collect the water at the bottom as it ran off of the monument, and they would give it to people who uh, who had been poisoned, and they believed that this would cure the people of their you know of dying from poison. Uh, but there is no <clears throat> there is no record of Horus actually healing the sick or performing any other uh, uh, miracles like that himself. Okay, so what we've got here is a situation where they had a ritual that involved pouring water over a stone with Horus on it and a Horus-connected myth. But in the story, it's actually not Horus who performs the miracle. It's Toth. Yes. And um, so Toth, in this case, is the source of the the healing power, not Horus, apparently. So there's uh, one disconnect right there. But then also... Even uh, even if, you know, you say, well, I, I prayed to Horus and he healed my nephew or something like that, or I, you know, I, I used this Horus object and, uh, and got a healing for my nephew, that's totally different than what is suggested by the mythicists, which is an image of Horus traveling from town to town, having compassion on people and healing them the way Jesus did. I mean, we're not talking about Horus going from you know, from one village to another and laying his hands on people and having them healed. Uh, even if you were to say, okay, well, he's a god, and so people are going to pray to him for healing. That's true of every single god. It doesn't make <laughs> them a parallel for uh, Jesus as a traveling healer. Right, right. 
Okay. Now, one of the one of the alleged miracles that Horus is supposed to have done is raise someone from the dead. And that's something that Jesus did on more than one occasion. He uh, he raised the the son of the widow of Nain, but more famously, he raised Lazarus from the dead. And that supposedly paralleled by Horus raising someone named something very similar, not Lazarus, but Azar. What can you tell us about that? Besides Azar as the middle letters to Lazarus, and that seems to be how they they uh, connect it. As it. It kind of begins with the translation issue, right? Is Azar, Azar is is not translated as Lazarus. Um, it, Osiris is is a Greek transliteration of the name Azar. If that makes any sense. Oh, okay. So, uh, okay, sure. Uh, I've also. Uh, um, Osir is another uh, way of representing Osiris's name in Egyptian, and so I could see how someone could transliterate that Azar. So, right. so is the claim is it's what the Egyptians said, or what the mythicists are claiming is that there was a resurrection done by Horus on Azar or Osiris, which is then somehow connected to Lazarus. Is that the claim? Yes, but. But Horus had nothing to do with resurrecting Osiris. Uh, right. In, was... in fact, Horus wasn't even conceived yet uh, right. because it was Isis uh, who who uh, arranged for the zombie raising of Osiris. <laughs> yeah. I have to qualify it like that because he doesn't really come back to life. He's just kind of reanimated, but he's still the Lord of the Dead. He's still dead. Yeah. Yeah, I don't I mean that 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 really is the the nuts and bolts of it. There's no there's no story of of uh of Horus raising anyone from the dead. Okay. Let's then talk about the end of Horus's life. Uh the mythicists will often claim that Horus was crucified. Uh is there any basis for that? Yeah, this is amazing. I don't know where it comes from. There's no equivalent to crucifixion in in any ancient Egyptian records. Uh, It it appears they didn't have anything like that as far as capital punishment went. Right. In fact, crucifixion is known as a Roman punishment, not an Egyptian one. Exactly. You know, and we've got plenty of evidence that the Romans actually used uh, crucifixion. The way that the mythicists make this parallel, or they try to make this parallel, is that they point to pictures of Horus and other gods standing in cruciform with their arms spread. Okay, so they're just, they're not on a cross, they're just standing up, spreading their arms. Yeah, yeah, and that's it, and that's their big claim that uh, Horus was crucified, that's how they draw that connection. But but John, no one ever stands up and spreads their arms unless they're being crucified. <laughs> I do it every morning when I get up and stretch. Uh, but then you must be being crucified. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, it's quite a stretch. Wow. Yeah. So. Uh, so. Okay. Nick's on the crucifixion. Um, is there? Is there any? Uh, are, are there any accounts in mythology of how um, how Horus did die, or if he even did die? Because after all, gods are are immortal unless something happens to them. Yeah. Well, there is that one story on the Metternich Stella of the child Horus being poisoned by Set and dying and, and Isis. Uh, <clears throat> Isis ends up pleading with Toth and then bringing uh, Horus back to life. But interestingly enough, in all of the research that I have done, that's the closest that any of these pre-Christian gods come to being a dying and rising god. Um, a lot of the, it seems to me that the uh, the the scholarly consensus, anyway, of, of modern scholars, is that this dying and rising god category is sort of bogus because they don't always fit into uh, uh, that need of a box. A lot of these gods are believed to have died and never returned in a permanent sense as the same deity. Okay, so he he at least according to at one account that we know of was killed. Um, but it wasn't as an adult at the end of a long ministry with 12 disciples and so forth. It was as a boy. Yes. And so when he was a child, uh, he was attacked by his uncle and uh, poisoned by his uncle and killed. And his mom was able to use magic to get him back. 
Yeah, absolutely. That's it. He he didn't he didn't resurrect of his own power. Um, Not after three days in a tomb or anything like that. Right. Even though you see those you know these lists of of uh, comparisons like that, there's just no there's there's just nothing to back that up. Okay. Um, anything else you want to say about the subject of Horus and mythicism, John? Yeah, I would say the same thing about any of these comparisons is to not let them uh, – don't don't let that be a an obstacle to your faith because a lot of people just don't have the time to go and look at all these little details and do all this research. I mean there, there are literally thousands of, of, of these – claims out there and uh you know to, to have to research every single one could be really time consuming um to me it's something that's interesting and it's sort of a hobby so i do spend a lot of time doing it but uh you know i have yet to find a convincing parallel anywhere that predates christianity and in particular we don't have evidence that the early christians were saying hey let's come up with this Jesus figure and model him after these pagan deities. There's just zero evidence for that. Uh, absolutely. So, you know, another good point that that uh, we could probably bring up here is that uh, the the mythology of the ancient Egyptians spans a period of 3,000 years. and Before the you know, time of Christianity. Right, before the time of Christianity. And so you have myths popping up and then, uh, you know, and being favored and then disappearing. And we know that now uh, because we're able to, uh, uh, you know, we've done a lot of excavation. Egyptology as an academic science has come a long way. Uh, but the, the first century Christians would have had no access to a lot of these stories that were buried in the desert. So when the, when the mythicists cherry pick these bits of myth that we know about now, there's no, there's no guarantee that the early Christians had any access to all these different myths in order to concoct a story about Jesus that was based on Horus. It wasn't like they could look them up on Wikipedia. <laughs> right. <laughs> Okay, cool. Um, well, listen, John, thank you very much for uh, being with me on the show here today. I know uh, mythicism is something that's out there, and it's been gaining some additional popularity through uh, atheist websites on the Internet lately, and I'm sure I'll be talking about it in the future. And I'd love to have you come back on and uh, talk about it with me. Is that okay? Absolutely. Okay. Till then, uh, where can people go to find out more about you and your writing and your own apologetics? I blog in two different places. Uh, one is on my own website, johnsorensen.net, and uh, I also am a contributing blogger to uh, the Catholic Answers blog at catholic.com. Okay. Catholic.com people can probably spell, how do they spell John Sorensen? J-O-N-S-O-R-E-N-S-E-N dot net. Okay. So John with no H and then Sorensen, not son. Yeah. Okay, awesome. Thank you very much, John. Thanks for having me on, Jimmy. It was a pleasure. That's going to do it for this episode of the show, folks. I very much appreciate John Sorensen uh, coming on and talking about mythicism with me. Once again, you can check out his work at catholic.com and at johnsorensen.net. That's J-O-N-S-O-R-E-N-S-E-N. Dot net. He's got a lot of interesting things to say. Oh, and to tie up just one loose end from earlier in the show, I don't really think that the pyramids were landing platforms for alien spaceships. That's just another reference to the movie Stargate. By the way, if you like the material I presented here, I hope you'll join my Secret Information Club, where I present fascinating information by email about the Catholic faith. You can sign up online and learn more about the club at secretinfoclub.com. Once again, that's secretinfoclub.com. Till next time, stay safe, stay well, God bless, and my name is Jimmy Aiken. <laughs>